The meeting will now come to order. Welcome to the June 14th, 2021 meeting of the City of Raleigh Board of Adjustment. My name is Rodney Swink and I'm chair of the board. I'm joined today by fellow board members John Koontz, Donald Mile, Justin Sutton, Marvin Butler, and Stephen Kenny. The Board of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial body that is governed by the North Carolina General Statutes and the City's Unified Development Ordinance. We conduct evidentiary hearings on requests for variances and special use permits, among other requests. The Board of Adjustment assures that the due process rights of the parties are, pr are protected when hearing cases. Since today's meeting will be conducted remotely, in addition to the general quasi-judicial rules, today's hearing will be conducted in concordance with the state statutes that allow for remote quasi-judicial evidentiary hearings during the current COVID-19 states of emergency. Before we begin the evidentiary hearings on today's agenda, I ask our attorney to briefly explain for the participants how we will be conducting today's evidentiary hearings. Okay, my name is Catherine Hill. I'm the, I'm the attorney for the Raleigh Board of Adjustment. Today's evidentiary hearings are going to be very similar to a regular meeting with a few minor adjustments. First, all witnesses must be sworn in. Because of the remote format, individuals who sign up to speak, as well as city staff participants, have already signed a written oath form, which will be reaffirmed on the record as they testify today. The participants have also already provided written consent to today's remote meeting. We will begin with the staff presentation and report from a member of the planning department. As a reminder, the standards that the applicant must meet to be granted approval are in the UDO. They're also set, set forth in the staff report and the applicant's application. The standard will be discussed by staff and the applicant throughout the hearing. The burden is on the applicant to provide competent material and substantial evidence as to each of the required standards to be granted the request. Following staff's presentation, the applicant will be acknowledged to present their case and witnesses. The BOA will acknowledge the attorney or applicant for each case first as the point person for the application. Following the applicant, anyone else who signed up to speak in support or opposition will, uh, to the request will be given the opportunity to speak. The applicant will then have the opportunity for a rebuttal and a closing statement. When all testimony is complete, the board will close the evidentiary hearing the board members will then deliberate and vote on the case. And following the meeting, the board's decision will be prepared with written findings of fact and conclusions of law, which will be incorporated into the meeting minutes and will be adopted at the same time as the meeting minutes are adopted. With that, I will hand it back over to you, Mr. Swink. Okay, thank you. We will now conduct the evidentiary hearings on today's agenda. As our attorney stated, the standard the applicant must be to be granted their request is set forth in the UDO and the board's decisions must be based upon competent material and substantial evidence related to the applicable standard. In the interest of efficiency, if you will be speaking in a hearing today, please focus your testimony and arguments on the applicable standard, not personal preference or opinion. Witnesses may testify as to facts to which they are competent to testify, so long as those facts relate to the legal standards. In addition, lay, where non-expert witness testimony is limited to facts, not opinions. Folks in your testimony and arguments on the applicable facts and standards will allow the board to hear cases in an efficient and timely manner. So let's begin with our old business, evidentiary hearing A, 741 Mills Street, Peggy Jen property owner. It's a special use permit VOA 0007-2021. The evidence you're hearing on this matter is continued to the next board meeting, which is July 12th, 2021. As background, this evidentiary hearing was previously continued from April 19th, 2021 and May 10th, 2021 BOA meetings. At the May 10th, 2021 BOA meeting, the applicant's attorney informed the board that the applicant would like to continue the evidentiary hearing on this matter to a date when the case can be heard in person. Pursuant to state law, we cannot hear a case virtually if the applicant does not consent to the virtual format, so we must grant this request and continue the evidentiary hearing. Second item of old business, evidentiary hearing B, 11009 Angleside Place, Westchester Commercials, the property owner, it's variances BOA 0010-2021. This evidentiary hearing was continued from April 19th, 2021 and May 10th, 2021 BOA meetings. 
I understand the attorney for the case, Michael Birch, has a request. Mr. Birch, are you with us? Yes, good morning, Chairman Swink. Uh, morning. Yes, we would uh, like to ask that the board defer this matter to the July 12 meeting. Okay, if there's no objection, we will uh, continue this case till the July 12th meeting. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Now the uh, third item of old business, evidentiary hearing C, 5706 Rock Quarry Road, 3801 Pearl Road, and 3831 Pearl Road, Aspen Spring Housing Associates LLC property owner. This is a variance, BOA 0019, 2021. This evidentiary hearing was continued from the board's May 10th, 2021 meeting, and this variance request has been withdrawn. So, having taken care of old business, we can now move to new business. Evidentiary hearing A, 4600 Pemberton Drive, Fred Eaker, property owner. This is a variance, BOA 0020-2021. Begin by swearing in the staff. Keegan McDonald is the planning staff case presenter. Present. Mr. McDonald, um, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And as for the participants, uh, we have Fred Eaker. Mr. Eaker, uh, will you please state your name and address for the record, and then I will reaffirm your oath. Yes, uh, Fred Ecker address is 4600 Pemberton Drive, Raleigh, North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Ecker. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, Mr. McDonald, case is yours. Okay, bear with me one moment as I pull up the presentation. So I'll begin just by reading the nature of request for this specific case. So this is a variance for complete relief from the provision set forth in section 728C1 of the UDO that states a fence or wall located within 20 feet of a thoroughfare right of way shall either be less than 42 inches in height or situated at least 15 feet from the edge of the right of way and be free with evergreen planting materials so that no more than one fourth of the fence or wall surface area will be visible from the thoroughfare within three years of erection of the fence or wall in order to legalize an already constructed fence without the prescribed uh, landscaping that is six feet in height and within 12 feet of the thoroughfare right of way. Um, this variance request is in conjunction with a detached house on a 0.35 acre property zoned R4 located at 4600 Pemberton Drive. So as you can see from this aerial, this um, particular property sits on the intersection of Pemberton Drive where it takes it address, its address and Falls of Noose, which is an avenue six lane divided street um, as identified in the Raleigh city uh, street plan. Here's just a image from that um, street plan taken from IMAPS, as you can see that that designation provided there. Um, before I actually show the picture, I just want to show the plot plan for the property. So obviously it has um, its, uh, eastern property boundary forms kind of the right of way line with Falls of Noose Road, and that's what's really in question here today. The applicant, as I understand it, applied for a fence permit to erect a, a wooden fence on their property, um, received the permit, but upon inspection, it was noted that the fence did not comply with the requirements set forth in 728C1, such that it was um, too close to the right of way without meeting the requisite height and um, screening requirements. So <clears throat> the applicant has requested a variance to basically legalize this fence, given the fact that it's um, already constructed, um, such that they can kind of keep it as is. 
Um, here is an image of the fence today. So from this image, you can tell there is some vegetation there. Um, it's not enough to satisfy the uh, screening that's required because that that mandates that um, no more than one fourth of the the um, fence surface area would be visible. Obviously, more than one fourth of it, the area is visible from this image, but there is some existing screening just by nature of um, trees that were kind of planted along that thoroughfare some time ago. Um, I also wanted to show, go back to the original image. This kind of shows the edge is kind of taken from the uh, far side of Falls of Noose Road. So that's the um, property um, majority screened by some other vegetation as well. Staff doesn't have any specific comment um, on this application. We're happy to try to answer any questions you may have related to the, the regulations. Um, but I know the property owner and applicant is also online, Mr. Ecker, um, to probably give a little bit more background and history, if that's something that the board is curious about. Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. Board members, do you have any questions? Okay, let's now move along. The applicant will now present evidence and legal arguments in support of the request. As a reminder to you, any evidence and arguments must focus on the applicable facts. Good morning, Mr. Ecker. You may proceed with your presentation. Good morning, Chairman Swink. Um, first, I want to say that city staff have been uh, very helpful with uh, all my questions uh, regarding the permit and this variance process. So I just want to thank everyone who's been involved. Um, I think Mr. McDonald um, presented um, my case very well. I'll just add that um, I took great care to um, in, in the permit process to make sure I submitted um, proper documentation and in particular my supplemental drawing. Um, I took great care in making sure that um, that, st that the permit permitting staff had everything that they needed. Um, and then I actually expected to get some feedback and some guidance. Um, and so when I found that the fence um, w did not pass an inspection, um, I had really hoped that I'd gotten the guidance to, um, you know, to set the fence back uh, before it had been built. Um, the fence is built with uh, metal posts. You can see it there in the, uh, in the picture um, that Mr. McDonald is displaying, uh, metal posts set in concrete. And behind that fence is a concrete driveway. Um, so it would be very difficult to uh, attempt to remove uh, the fence or um, or move it completely. Um, and you'll note there in the supplemental drawing, there there is a section labeled that would be close to, close to the easement, 12 foot long section. So that would have given an indication to the permit staff that um, it would have potentially been less than 15 feet uh, as required by the UDO. So my, my variance request is really a result of, um, you know, the permit process not uh, giving me the proper feedback to um, build the fence according to the UDO. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ecker, your application exhibits were provided ahead of the meeting and are in board docs, but would you please ask to have those admitted to the record? Yes, yes. please admit those documents uh, to the record. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we'll go to board for questions. Do you have any questions for Mr. Ecker, anyone? Okay, no additional participants signed up to speak either in favor of or in opposition to this. Um, good to our sort of closing here. Uh, McDonald, Mr. McDonald, do you have anything else you want to add at this point? Not at this time. Okay, Mr. Ecker, anything else? No, Chairman Swink, thank you. Okay, we'll close the evidentiary hearing and move to our board deliberations. And uh, Stephen Kenny is our alternate. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, John Coons, motion to approve. Thank you, Mr. Coons. We have a motion to approve. May I have a second? Second. Uh, was it Mr. Sutton? It was Ms. Mile. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mile. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? 
We'll move to a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Smith, if you'll call the roll, and again, Stephen Kenny will be voting. Chairperson Srink. Approved. Mr. Koontz. Approved. Mr. Sutton. Approved. Mr. Mile. Approved. Mr. Kenny. Approved. You received five uh, positive votes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ecker. Let's move along now to a uh, second item of business day evidentiary hearing B. This is 3836 Cottage Rose Lane. Jonathan and Jerry Goldstein, property owners, Severians, BOA 0021-2021. Our staff has been uh, administered the oath. It says for the participants, when I state your name, will you please restate your name and address for the record and I can reaffirm your oath. Uh, Jerry Goldstein. Cottage Rose Lane, North Carolina. Okay, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Mr. McDonald, thank you. back to you. Thanks very much. Give me one moment. Okay. All right. So this is a request for a 10 foot variance to the rear lot line setback requirements set forth in section uh, 242 of the UDL um, to convert an existing screen porch into a room that results in a 10 foot rear lot line setback in conjunction with a detached house on the 0.19 acre property zoned R4 conditional use located at 38. 36 Cottage Rose Lane. So this is um, similar to obviously a few other requests that the board has considered. Uh, this property was developed as part of what was known as a cluster development, um, meaning there was some relief provided related to um, setbacks and other lot dimension, dimensional requirements um, when it was constructed. Hence, it's kind of uh, condensed format. Um, you can see that a number of the homes actually exist as um, townhouses or are uh, attached to one another. This home sits slightly askew and is technically detached, but kind of shares a similar um, form to the others. Here is a um, plot plan of the property. You can see in the corner. Um, sunroom or excuse me the existing screen porch is identified um, to the rear and so what's being requested is the opportunity to enclose this screened in porch into a sunroom um, whenever such space is enclosed entirely even if not um, conditioned with HVAC um, it is considered conditioned space for purposes of applying zoning regulations, particularly setbacks, so it must adhere to the 20 foot um, rear yard setback requirement. There's also a unique condition to the, the lot lines. Um, it obviously does not have a regular rectangular shape. Um, and so if you notice the two arrows related to the, the back um, right corner of the home and the, um, the lot line, that is perpendicular from that point, you can see that's a, a 10 foot distance. And so that's what's um, relevant to the, the variance request in this instance. There are some other images here um, kind of showing the, the condition of the, the uh, sunroom, the porch to be converted to a sunroom. Um, so obviously it's an elevated space, the conversion will not increase the encroachment um, into the rear yard, it's kind of simply um, a material slash aesthetic change. Here's some interior images of the screen porch and some images showing it from, from the rear. Um, so you can see it's flush with the uh, exterior walls of the existing dwelling. So staff really has no comment um, on the application except to say that the, um, the original porch may have been conforming 
and permitted to encroach into the rear yard. However, uh, as stated earlier, Sunrim is considered condition space and must adhere to the principal structure setback. So that's what's really necessitating the variance. I have no further comments, but I'm here to answer any questions. Um, if not, I can pass it off to the applicant. Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. Um, so I'm assuming it's the screen porch port. So just the upper portion that we see is what's under consideration. That's my understanding. Yes. Okay, thank you. Board members, you have any other questions for Mr. McDonald? Okay, let us move along. The applicant uh, may now present evidence and legal arguments in support of the request. Mr. Eatman is here representing uh, the, the client today. So, uh, Jim Eatman, you may proceed with your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Jim Eatman uh, with the law firm of Lynch and Eatman in Raleigh. Uh, I would like to start by asking that the, uh, the application in this presentation and materials be submitted into the record at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, and Keegan, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, Keegan did a great job describing the request and the property, so I, I won't spend too much time rehashing that on these next few slides. Um, just quickly, uh, we are requesting a 10 foot variance to the rear lot line setback, and that's to allow uh, the owners to enclose this second story uh, screened porch with glass windows, which uh, results in additional condition space as Keegan referenced. Um, and we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, here again is a screenshot from the plot plan. Um, Keegan showed you this a minute ago. Uh, you can see I've highlighted the encroachment there. Um, you can see the outline of the porch as well on the back corner of the home. Uh, there will be no change to the footprint of the porch. Uh, they're not expanding it or altering the dimensions in any way. Uh, they're just just want to enclose the what's already there on the the second story. Um, and again, as Keegan referenced, you see the odd shape of the rear lot line, and um, you can note as well that this is a, a detached home, whereas a lot of the other homes here are are townhomes. Um, and Keegan, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, here are some additional pictures of the home for better perspective. You can see on the left the uh, screenshot from Google Street View. It's hard to tell here, but that is actually a, a detached home. Um, you can also see it's set back a little bit further from the street than the uh, home to the right. Um, the photo on the right is a uh, screenshot from Google Earth. Gives you a little bit of a, a different perspective of the porch, and you can see that second story there on the corner of the home. Um, again, you know, this layout isn't going to change at all. Uh, the configuration, the footprint will remain the same, essentially just enclosing it with glass. Um, and Keegan, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, you've seen these, um, obviously, interior and exterior pictures of the porch. So, uh, Keegan, we can just go ahead and go to the next one. Um, and this is fine, Keegan, you can stay here. The, the one we just flew through was the other, uh, the same elevation drawings you've already seen um, that show that only the second story of the porch is, uh, is being enclosed with glass <clears throat> and uh, the footprint is remaining the same. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and get into the, uh, the specific standards under the UDO for the uh, for granting of a variance. Uh, the first standard that an unnecessary hardship will result from strict application of the ordinance. Uh, that is true here. Uh, the unnecessary hardship is that the encroachment, uh, which only came about when the UDO was adopted, uh, prevents the property owners from making improvements that are uh, not only minor, but, but also necessary. Uh, enclosing in the porch increases the utility of the home. They'll have additional condition space to use. Uh, which these days is is more important than ever. Um, it'll increase energy efficiency. It increases security and uh, obviously increases the value of the home as well. Uh, it'll also add some increased privacy for the gold scenes and their neighbors um, since it'll eliminate any sound that you could normally hear from a, a screened porch. Um, and again, it's just a, a minor change to uh, to what's already there. So, uh, Keegan, if you'll move to the next slide, please. Uh, the second standard that the hardship results from conditions peculiar to the property, uh, certainly the case here. Uh, 
um, the shape of the lot and the way the home is oriented within the lot uh, are both unique to this property. It's not something that's generally applicable to the neighborhood or to uh, to the larger community. Um, there are other homes in this neighborhood that do not violate the setbacks, the current setbacks. And to the extent there are other homes that, that do have setback violations, uh, the degree of the encroachment would vary um, on a case-by-case -case basis based on the size and shape of the lot in the home. So this isn't a, a uniform issue throughout the neighborhood at, at all. Um, and Keegan, if you'll move on to the next slide, please. Uh, the third standard that the hardship did not result from actions taken by the property owner. Uh, again, uh, the home was built prior to adoption of the UDO. Uh, once the UDO setbacks were applied, the porch then became non-conforming. Um, the property owners did not create the encroachment and uh, they've done nothing to increase the degree of the encroachment or create any other non-conformities on the property. So um, with that in mind, the hardship here is, is not a result of actions taken by the property owner. Um, and Keegan, if you could move on to the next slide. Um, the last standard that the variance is consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the ordinance. Um, presumably, the, the spirit and purpose of the ordinance is not to prevent these sorts of minor improvements, uh, especially when you're, you're not worsening a pre-existing encroachment. Uh, there will be no adverse impact on on neighbors or the environment or um, you know public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, that's in part why there's no opposition here today. And this is I'd note as well that this has also been approved by the uh, the neighborhood HOA already. Um, the appearance of the improvements is consistent consistent with the appearance of the home uh, and the appearance of other homes in the neighborhood. So it promotes uniformity, which is is certainly in line with the spirit of the UDO. Um, so for those reasons, we we contend that the fourth standard is is met as well. And uh, Keegan, if you could go to the last slide, please. I'll uh, just quickly wrap up and reiterate a few of the main points. Um, again, a 10 foot variance here to the the rear lot line setback uh, to enclose an existing second story porch is uh, is our request. Um, built pre -D pre UDO. Uh, property owners haven't increased the encroachment and they won't be increasing the encroachment with uh, the improvements described today. Um, instead, this this will just allow the property owners to make a, a very minor change to what's already there. Um, and that change will not have any negative effect on the neighbors or the, uh, the public at large. So um, with that, I'll say thank you for your time. And unless there are any other questions from the board, uh, that concludes my presentation. <coughs> Okay, thank you, Mr. Eatman. Board members, do you have any questions? Okay, we uh, have no additional participants signed up to speak either in support or opposition today. So we'll move to a closing. Uh, no questions from the board. Mr. Eatman has wrapped his presentation. Mr. McDonald, anything further from you? Not at this time. Okay, then let's close the evidentiary hearing and move to board deliberations. Uh, commentary or certainly entertain a motion. Uh, this is Mr. Miles. Since it's not increasing the footprint, that I would make a motion to go ahead and approve. Thank you, Mr. Miles. We have a motion to approve. May I have a second? I second that motion. Justin Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. We have a motion to approve and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, Ms. Smith will move to our uh, roll call vote. And once again, Mr. Kenny will be voting. Are you there? Well, yes, ma'am. Okay, I, I did not hear your vote. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I did not hear you ask. Yes, I, I approve. Uh, Mr. Coons? Approve. Mr. Sutton? Approve. Mr. Mile? Approve. Mr. Kenny? Approve. The motion received five votes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's move along to our next item of new business. This is the address is 0-857-861-865 West Morgan Street and 905 
Tryon Hills Drive, MMP LLC and Gary Hoover are property owners. This is a variance BOA 0025-2021. Uh, we'll move to the uh, applicants for our swearing in. Uh, Greg Sandruder, if you would state your name and address for the record, please. Yes, uh, Greg Sandroider, 104 Lake Cliff Court in Cary, North Carolina. And Mr. Sandroider, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Kenneth Thompson. Yes, uh, Ken Thompson. And your address, please? 10 South Wilmington Street, Raleigh. Um, Ms. Smith, were you able to get that address? Could you repeat your address, Mr. Thompson? Yes, 510 South Wilmington Street. Okay, thank you. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Ms. McDonald? Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a two-part request, uh, the first being a variance for complete relief from the minimum two-foot ground floor elevation requirement set forth in section 324F1 of the UDO. Uh, the second being a two-foot variance from the requirement that a building foundation wall within 30 feet of a primary street shall have a maximum height of five feet set forth in UDO section 728D3 to erect up to a seven-foot wall in order to construct two apartment buildings on the 2.97 acre property zone CX7 UG, CX7 UL, conditional use, NX4 UL, and uh, special residential parking overlay district. Um, there are obviously multiple addresses for this property as it's located along West Morgan Street and Tryon Hills Drive. So um, this request, as kind of stated in that nature of request, is related to um, a uh, four to seven story um, mixed use apartment building uh, development that will consist of approximately 401 residential units and 9,000 square feet of retail space. So um, the development is located along the bend in West Morgan Street, just south of Hillsborough Street. Um, it spans multiple parcels and um, will result in the closure of that small um, kind of loop that's shown on the bottom of this image. <clears throat> Both requests are pertinent to um, the topography on the site. So I realize this is sort of small font, but at the corner of Tryon Hills Drive and West Morgan Street, um, Roughly, you know, there's a topography marker there at 358 feet of elevation that drops off to the bottom corner of the site, um, roughly about 20 to, to 30 feet, depending on exactly where you're measuring. So, so both projects are impact, or excuse me, both requests are relevant to the topographic difference um, across the site making it um, difficult to comply with both the minimum ground floor elevation requirement and then also um, the, the limitation on uh, foundation wall height uh, in order to kind of level the site and, and make sure that it's um, being used to kind of the, the fullest extent possible. Here is a site plan just showing how the, the property will be laid out. Just one unique condition. Um, as stated, there's two buildings, but they'll be conjoined. Um, so that dark line in the middle of this image kind of separates the buildings from a building code and zoning code perspective. But functionally, it will be uh, one building, you know, for purposes of the user um, and the general public and how it will kind of appear from the outside. Um, again, there's the road closure that will take place along West Morgan Street, which will be providing access um, to the parking area in the rear. Um, I will note there was a recent text change, TC1919, which while not, well, it has not gone into effect yet, will go into effect on the 17th of June, um, which the applicant should have the opportunity to take advantage of the regulations, which did remove 
the two foot minimum ground floor elevation requirement for all um, apartments and townhouses. So um, my comments will be more limited to the foundation wall in this instance. Um, so as stated, the foundation wall requirements state that there is a um, maximum height uh, of five feet that's permitted when a foundation wall is located within 30 feet of primary street. So this is the primary street elevation as identified on the site plan along um, Morgan Street. And it's my understanding you can kind of see the foundation wall um, underneath the building in this instance. Um, the intent really of that limitation on foundation wall height um, is to uh, reduce the visual impacts of large foundation walls on street users. Um, and we understand that there are uh, obviously significant topographic challenges on the site that may necessitate um, larger than average foundation walls, especially when um, wanting to uh, again kind of maximize the per, the the, the uh, um, building envelope and exactly how um, far out you can kind of develop it as it relates to the street. Um, but there are some comments we have that are kind of taken from that recent text change, just for the board consideration if they think they would be um, relevant to today's discussion. Uh, before I get to those, I just want to show some reference images. Um, so here is the intersection of Morgan and Tryon Hills Drive, and you can see how the property kind of slopes as you go down Tryon Hills Drive, which is in this image kind of shown perpendicular, um, where the, uh, the cars are kind of lined up down that street. This next image just kind of takes you um, to the left from that previous image showing the existing structures and then that loop, uh, which is an offshoot to the right from, from Morgan Street that will be closed. Um, and so there's some uh, topographic change too related to that uh, street closure. So the comments I wanted to provide to the board just for consideration are that TC 1919, again, which will go into effect on the 17th, um, does permit now uh, foundation walls to be taller than five feet, provided they um, include one of the following treatments that would cover 75% of the building foundation wall area. Um, overall foundation wall height would still be limited to eight feet, but I wanted to provide these to the board for their consideration uh, if they think one may be uh, useful in this specific scenario. So, I won't go through all of them in, in detail unless you all want to, but there's foundation plantings. Um, obviously, those that are kind of planted directly into the ground adjacent to the foundation wall uh, planters, which would be, um, you know, self contained plants um, in their own pots. Access meaning kind of stairs or ramps that um, would provide access from the, the sidewalk to the actual building. Um, seating that could be provided, and then also transit improvements, whether that be um, some type of, again, seating or, or stop um, that could provide some screening of the foundation wall. So those were really staff's only comments. Um, I'm happy to try and answer any questions you may have. If there are not, I can pass it off to the applicant. Okay, thanks, Mr. McDonald. Board members, do you have any questions? Okay, and let's go um, along. Isabel Maddox, welcome. You may uh, proceed with your presentation this morning. Good morning. Um, glad to be here this morning. Um, here today, Isabel Maddox, uh, PO Box 946, Raleigh 27602. Uh, here today representing Hamilton Merritt, the lead developer of this project. Um, first, I'd like to move that our application materials and uh, the electronic exhibits submitted today uh, be admitted to the record. Thank you. Um, this is a proposal for a, a multifamily and mixed use development uh, at this uh, West Morgan Street location. Uh, there, there are five parcels included as shown on exhibit one. Next slide, please. Uh, 
um, and as you can see, those are severed by the, that little piece of the West Morgan Street right of way. We have requested closure of that right of way. And next slide, please. You can see the red hashed areas are the areas of right of way that uh, that we have requested closure. That matter will be before council on July 6th. Um, as to the two foot uh, elevation variance, uh, that will be resolved by the text change that, as Keegan mentioned, so we've, we're focusing today on the uh, variance to UDO section 7.3.5D foundation wall height. That one, while that was addressed by the text change as well, that's a little more nuanced the way that is addressed in the text change. That provides some you know, mitigation opportunities to allow a, a taller foundation wall. However, um, those that text change did not was not adopted until May, and this this uh, site plan has been in the works for much longer than that. And so, our site plan does not match those um, mitigation opportunities exactly. Although we do include and incorporate many of those mitigation features in our design, and you'll hear about that a little bit more later. Um, the variance is to the requirement that a foundation wall be no taller than five feet with when within 30 feet of the right of way. The intent of the ordinance is to reduce visual impacts and thus to create an environment that's more of a pedestrian scale. Um, and we're seeking this variance to facilitate a mixed use development, which is being designed to facilitate a multifamily with mixed restaurant and retail uses on the ground floor. We believe those will definitely be a pedestrian scale. We hope that that will allow us to reduce vehicular traffic and encourage walkability. Uh, without this variance, we will not be able to build this um, project as designed. Uh, and so I think we do suffer that hardship addressing the, the initial standard for a variance. Um, we're seeking relief on both corners of this development. If, if you go to the next slide, you'll see those highlighted in yellow. Um, and one is the the um, corner of West Morgan and Tryon Hills Road, and the other is West Morgan, and there's a railroad right away that we're on the corner of there. Um, at this point, I'd like to call Ken Thompson, the landscape architect we're working with, uh, who is the lead um, landscape architect developing this site plan. Oh, good morning, everyone. Hopefully, uh, there's no echo any longer. Um, when I checked in, there seemed to be one. Um, if, Keegan, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, we have some notes indicated here on the site plan. Um, if we go to the next slide, they're actually a little easier to read. Number six. Um, so on the corner of Tryon and Morgan Street, uh, the existing slope on Tryon Hills Drive currently is about 12%. Um, again, the the ordinance is that a uh, foundation wall within 30 foot of a the primary street sidewalk cannot exceed five feet. Um, our preliminary grading currently has the building set at about 363 foot elevation, um, and that's to uh, provide positive strain positive drainage from the building out to the curb line. Um, and that gives us about a height of, of 5.67 feet. So we're about you know, three quarters of a foot greater than five foot allowed. Um, again, you know, we're in plenary stages. We're not in um, uh, CDs yet. Uh, this could change, it could increase or it could decrease, but we felt it was best to uh, ask for that variance now uh, instead of getting slowed up uh, later on having to amend our ASR. Um, in the southeast corner, um, as Isabel noted, uh, we are parallel to the um, railroad there. Um, we're closing that right away easement. And the idea to, is that Morgan Street is significantly higher than the railroad. So as we come in on that entry drive, uh, we drop, uh, I think we're running about eight and a half percent so that the road is about the same level as the railroad once they're railroad right away once they're parallel to each other. Um, the, the finished floor of the building there, there's a small typo. Uh, I transposed two numbers there. So the um, 
the finished grade is 356 and the proposed floor elevation is 362. So we're about six foot. Um, as you can see, if you uh, if we go back to slide five, um, there are a lot of utilities in that area. We're having to reroute some sewer and some storm drainage. Um, we could possibly add a uh, retaining wall or something of that nature uh, to comply. But again, you know, we're preliminary stages. We're not in CDs yet, and there's the concern that one of those uh, utilities would have an easement parallel to the wall, and we would not be able to add that um, retaining wall or shrubs or anything that would make us in compliance. Uh, if we can skip down two slides to number seven. Uh, oops, back one, please. Um, this is an enlargement that was provided. We had a, a administrative alternate for build two on the corner of Morgan and Tryon Hills. Um, the UDO um, asked for, you know, supports the buildings being up close to the right of way and also that the entry doors be on the corners. Um, and in order to do that, we pulled the, the wall face on the ground floor level back to create a, a an outdoor area. Uh, there will be building above it, um, but you can see we added um, benches and planters and some other amenities uh, for that uh, administrative alternate. Um, and let's see, we can go ahead again, Keegan. Um, this is an artistic uh, rendering of the site. Um, again, it has some, um, it, it indicates what it'll look like at that corner, but there is some artistic uh, license here. Uh, the building really isn't that close to Morgan Street and the grade shown going down Tryon is actually a little steeper than is depicted in that rendering. Uh, if we can advance to the next slide, please. Uh, this is an exhibit that Keegan shared earlier. Um, the middle image is the north elevation along Tryon Hill. Again, there's a little artistic license in this and that um, the grade separation between on the left side of that entry and the proposed grade is actually, you know, greater, closer to five and six foot. And if we can move to the next slide, please. So on the um, lower, the lower elevation and on the left hand or right hand side, uh, that is uh, a view from the railroad on the back side of that building. Um, you can see there's uh, two windows that are uh, shaded fairly dark there, and that we have a foundation wall in that area that's you know over five foot currently proposed. Uh, that's all I have for right now. I'm available for questions. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, so to conclude, I think uh, we have presented evidence, which has been competent, material, substantial, uh, that we have we will suffer a hardship if this variance is not granted, um, and that we have also presented evidence of the physical and legal hardships, which are the, basically the, the topo, the grades uh, that we're dealing with here, and the difficulty in complying with the uh, urban lim limited frontage um, in while dealing with these grades and topo. Um, these, these hardships pre-existed the development and are unique to the site, were not created by the applicant. Um, we've also provided evidence that this any impacts created by this variance will be well mitigated by various features, including uh, plantings, benches, uh, pedestrian areas that will create a pedestrian scale. And we feel like this will provide sort of a connection from the Hillsborough Street uh, pedestrian area to the downtown proper pedestrian area. Uh, we feel like these mitigating features together with the public benefits of adding mixed use, more housing, uh, adding to the pedestrian field, West Morgan, are consistent with the spirit, intent, and purpose of this ordinance to, ordinance to reduce visual impacts of taller foundation walls. And um, 
with that, we'll conclude, but uh, I and Mr. Thompson and Mr. Sandreuter are available for any questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Maddox. Um, board members, do you have questions? I'll start with one while you're thinking. Uh, it was mentioned, uh, Ms. McDonald mentioned the five possible modifications to or mitigations to the foundation wall. I understand that you're not quite sure about the utilities yet, and there's some uncertainty about you're not at the CD level yet, but can you give us a sense of what you're thinking about how you might mitigate that uh, impact, the visual impact of that of that foundation wall where it does not meet the five foot standard? Well, I think I'll let Ken address that specifically, but I think, you know, the uh, believe that the and go back to slide number I want to say uh, five maybe um, five, uh, six you can see there um, where we have some benches and, and plantings noted um, and I think that that the, the specific um, requirements of those mitigating factors were not really approved or adopted until May and it won't be effective till later this month. Um, we haven't, we don't match those exactly, but we, we generally, and, and Ken, you want to add to that? Yes, you know, um, the site has an urban frontage on it. Um, we have urban general and urban limited. Uh, you know, our build to is 20 foot and the UDO um, encourages that the building be up on the corner. Um, and so that's what we what that's what we have proposed at this time. Um, as we look at this graphic here um, to the top of the page, you see that stairwell um, right after that stairwell. There is a planter uh, to break up the, the foundation wall uh, as you head down try on and that kind of that steps with it. Uh, and that does not exceed that does not exceed five foot as it heads. Uh, that would be west down Tryon Hill. Um, obviously on the, the opposite side, the southeast corner, um, our intent, you know, would be to provide the required um, shrubs or another wall to break up that height. But again, we would like to have the variance in our pocket in case, um, you know, the utilities change over there and we're unable to put something in that utility easement. Okay, thank you. Um, board members, any other questions? I guess just to follow up to Mr. Chairman Swink, I said, I think Ken, you said you were within eight inches of meeting compliance on that. Is that what you said earlier? You said three quarters of a foot. Roughly. Correct. You know, I'd say, yeah, right now uh, the proposed is about 0.67 feet. Um, and that occurs looking at this graphic that we have up right now. That's about, you, well, you can see the 30 foot dimension on Tryon Hill Drive, so it's right about the middle of that bench. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Butler. Anyone else? Okay, we have no additional participants signed up either in opposition or in favor of this case, so we can move to our closing. Ms. Maddox, anything further from you? No, I just I do want to add that we did request a two foot variance. We don't think we'll need all of that, but we would like to stick with that request just to provide a little bit of flexi flexibility to, as we go toward toward the full grading study of this property. Okay, duly noted. Mr. McDonald, anything else from you? Not at this time. Thank you. Let's close the evidence you're hearing and move to our board. Um, Ms. Rudisil has joined us. Welcome. So uh, I'll certainly entertain commentary or a motion. This is Ms. Mile. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve. Thank you. I have a motion to approve from Mr. Mile. Is there a second? John. John Coons, second. Thank you, Mr. Coons. We have a motion to approve and a second. Is there any further discussion? And let's move to our uh, roll call vote and uh, note that Ms. Rudisil is now will now be voting. Um, I bl believe you're mu muted still. Yes. Okay. 
No, you muted and you unmuted and you. One more time. Now you're right. Don't. OK. <laughs> All right, we'll get this right in a minute. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Swank. Approve. Mr. Kuntz. Approve. Mr. Sutton. Approve. Mr. Mile. Approve. Mr. Kenny. No, but this time Ms. Rudis will be will be voting. Oh, so she okay. She's with us, yes. Okay, Ms. Ru um Ms. Rudisel. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Smith. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move along now to our next item of new business. This is 2734 Gebb Drive, Whitmill H. Webb, the fourth property owner. It's a variance BOA 0022 2021. Um, Mr. Webb, would you state your name and address for the record? And I will reaffirm your oath. Yes, Whitmill Hill Webb the fourth and twenty seven thirty four Rothgeb Drive in Raleigh. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Kenneth Carmack, if you're here, would you state your name and address for the record, please? Kenneth L. Carmack the second address is twenty seven thirty Rothgeb Drive, Raleigh. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and uh, Mr. Hodge, I believe we need to uh, actually affirm your oath. I skipped right past you. I apologize. We do, and I think we have one other external person. Okay, I don't have any other names on my list. Let's get you, and then let's get you first, Eric, and okay. then we'll clarify that. So, Eric, do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Now, who is this extra person you think we have? Um, I thought Mr. Webb had an attorney. Yes, we do have the attorney. We do not need to be uh, administering the oath. We have David Yaw listed. Oh, okay. 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 Well, if that's clear, thank you for double checking that. And uh, Eric, we'll go ahead with your presentation. All right. Um, Whitmore Webb, the fourth property owner, is requesting a variance of 6.3 feet to the encroachment allowance set forth in section 1.5.4.d.1.a point 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 of the Unified Development Ordinance in order to permit the construction of wooden porch stairs on the front of a detached house uh, that would be 11.7 feet from the primary street right of way on a 0.35 acre property zoned residential four and uh, located at 2734 Rothgeb Drive. Uh, this is an aerial showing the property. Uh, the property across the street is actually part of the city's uh, parks and recreation system and greenway along Crabtree Creek. Uh, so that's why the large uh, property diagonally kind of across the street is shown as being vacant. Um, this is the proposed uh, residence with a porch and a pretty significant uh, staircase uh, on the front of the new home um, that would be encroaching into the right of way. Uh, this property is subject to the infill regulations, which would allow for a uh, house to be as close as 27 feet, I believe, from the street right of way. The code then allows a, a, a porch and its stairs to encroach an additional nine feet into that um, setback, um, which would allow for a porch and the stairs to be as close as 18 feet uh, from the right of way uh, edge. However, as noted herein, they are proposing that that be 11.7 feet. Uh, again, this is just the uh, zoning, uh, residential four zoning all around, and this gives you a little bit better perspective of the city of Raleigh uh, parks property uh, and greenway trail system uh, located on the large parcel across uh, Rothgeb Drive from the subject property. Um, the topo on the site, as you can see, uh, with the topo lines being fairly close together, is a uh, pretty significant uh, along the front portion of the property. Um, and that's contributing uh, to uh, this uh, applicant's request. Uh, I'll let the applicant go into more detail 
uh, about uh, the various factors um, that have led to this uh, proposed layout. But staff does recognize that there are um, some ex some situations on this property that are not uh, necessarily uh, common to the neighborhood, given the, the steep topo across from the uh, floodplain um, associated with Crabtree Creek. Unless you have any questions of me at this time, that would conclude my presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hobbs. Board members, questions? Okay, let's uh, invite David Yop uh, to uh, present the case for the uh, applicant, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Swink. Um, and thank you to the Raleigh staff and Mr. Hodge for their assistance um, during the application process. Um, before I get started, just wanted to move that our application materials and the exhibits that we've uh, submitted be entered into the record. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as Eric noted, um, really the the um, the whole rub on this application um, is due to the topography of the land, and we'll take a look at some pictures of the lot um, in a minute. But I'm just going to kind of go ahead and jump into our uh, application and the necessary factors um, that we have to address to get the um, the variance hopefully granted. And um, in terms of the um, unnecessary hardship in the strict application of the UDO, um, if you'll take a look at the, you can see from the, um, the plot plan here that there is a uh, an excessive slope and there it's an unusually shaped lot. It's a, it's not common to the neighborhood. It's a pie shaped lot. You can see how the back um, edges just kind of converge on each other. And um, I know that Buck, uh, Mr. Webb has done um, a lot of work with the architects and engineers to try to, you know, minimize other uh, potential um, issues with the UDO and you can see that if you were to move uh, really the driveway or the the resident the residents um, it's going to create issues with rear and side setbacks um, so I just want to make that comment on the front end that they've done a lot of work to um, work with what they have um, as Mr. Hodge noted there's we're requesting a 6.23 foot setback for the front stairs um, really, the issue with the stairs um, is safety. The slope is so um, uh, so severe that the stairs have to be lengthened to accommodate that. And uh, Mr. Hodge, if you don't mind going to slide three, that just gives you um, an idea of the front elevate elevation um, of the property and why the the stairs have to be lengthened and get into the setback um there's you know as we said that mr webb has tried to look at different possible configurations and this is the best one that they could come up with um you, you know the unnecessary hardship um is uh really it's going to prevent it, if the variance wasn't granted it would prevent uh, mr webb from utilizing the most functional design given the lot conditions and he's, as we said, they're trying to maximize overall compliance with the UDO. Um, moving on to uh, the conditions that are peculiar to the property, I think Mr. Hodge already noted that um, uh, it is across the street um, from city property. There is a floodplain. I also want to note uh, that if you'll look, uh, Mr. Hodge, if you don't mind going back to slide two for a second. Um, if you look at the right of way, it kind of because of the topography, the, the way the street um, bends around the property, uh, the right of way kind of bends in. If you'll look where the stairs extend out, um, so that if the if the home were able to be placed on another portion of the lot, perhaps more to the front, um, uh, if you move to the left and a little bit more to the front. I believe they would be in compliance or the requested variance would be significantly less, but the right of way just happens to bend in um, right where the stairs have to be placed. So I want to note that on the front end. 
Um, again, the lot's shape is very unique. It's pie shape. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, you know, of the practical uh, implications, if you don't go in, mind going to slide number five, Mr. Hodge, that's a good shot, kind of a corner view coming around the bend in the street. Um, I believe it's slide number five. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you can see the excessive slope in the front. Um, the existing home, I believe, was built in 1957. Um, obviously, all this predates the UDO. Um, but uh, as far as I can tell from my numbers, the the lot, the excessive slope on the lowest elevation is 214 feet at the front at the front door, and the highest point 240 feet at the rear. So that just gives you an idea in terms of the numbers. Um, the extreme elevation and the conditions on the lot require the proposed um, front porch and the entrance to be to the second story of the home. That's another reason for the height of the stairs and lengthening them out. Um, again, the plot plan that we have is meant to minimize the overall encroachment and maintain functionality given the slope. Moving on to number three in terms of the factors, um, the hardship certainly didn't result from actions taken by Mr. Webb, the owner and applicant. Um, the, this lot, as far as I know, has, has not been regraded or anything since the existing home was built. Um, the property owner hasn't taken any actions to date to cause those challenging conditions. And the architect, um, you know, has kind of, uh, inherited um, the lot and done the best that they can with it. Um, in terms of uh, whether the variance request is consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the ordinance, we um, certainly claim that it is. Um, we you don't anticipate any impact on neighbor um, uh, on neighbors with this. Um, again, it's, you know, just because we have to lengthen the staircase or getting into the setback um, really is a safety issue. I think if the stairs were on any steeper incline, um, it would just be pronounced trying to navigate up and down. Um, we do contend that it's also consistent with the city's comprehensive plan of, you know, keeping compact development and redevelopment and um, conserving the, you know, the character of single family neighborhoods. Um, the proposed home is, is, is in line with the characteristics of the neighborhood, trying to make the best adaptive reuse of the lots existing topography that we can. And, um, you know, m my understanding is that acts are, you know, to encourage recreational activity, daylighting and ensure privacy, the, the extension, the small extension of the front steps is certainly not going to impact any of those considerations. Um, in our um, contention. And um, we think really just kind of the, the points that button things up or that the, the most functional design has been employed to improve the property. Um, we believe that the requested variance is um, consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the setback regulations, and that there's not gonna be a material impact on any neighboring properties or the city's uh, you know, property across the street. And we certainly contend that substantial justice would be um, achieved for Mr. Webb. Um, you know, a, the front porch is obviously going to be important on this um, land, given the topography, and um, it's going to be the main entrance, and has to uh, again extend up to the second story because of the land conditions. Um, that is really the the meat of our presentation uh, in terms of my piece, I would ask you, uh, Mr. Hodge, if you don't mind just clicking through uh, slide seven, um, that gives you, a, uh, that gives you a view of the front of the house with, I think generally where the, um, that again, that's, yeah, thank you. Um, those are just kind of all the angles and um, that's a great, if you don't mind just going back to slide 11 real quick, I think that's a great close up view um, to show the excessive slope and 
the general idea of where the stairs going to come down in the new property. Um, with that, I, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Mr. Webb can answer um, anything that might be directed to him. And I believe we also have a neighbor who's testifying uh, in support of the variant request. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yop. Uh, board members, do you have any questions? Okay, we do have uh, one person who has signed up to speak in support of this case, Mr. Carmack. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Ken Carmack. I live at 2730 Rothkamp Drive, directly next door to the Webbs. Uh, we've been here for 17 years and have been neighbors of the Webbs for about 14 of those years. And I'm appearing in support of their application for the variance. Um, I've reviewed the, the application with uh, myself and then with uh, the Webbs. And it's my opinion that the proposed structure will be consistent with other homes in the neighborhood and size, style, and design. Um, and it's my understanding that the shape, orientation of the topo, uh, topo of the lot makes the encroachment into the setback necessary for the improvements and it should not adver adversely impact the neighborhood street or access by public resources. Um, denial of the variance will, it's my understanding, will create undue hardship on the homeowner. And again, I, I appear in support of this application. So happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Carmack. Board members, do you have questions? <clears throat> okay, hearing none, we have no one who signed up in opposition to this case. So we'll move to our closing. Um, Mr. Yop, anything further from you? Swink, I would just add one additional comment and then I'll, um, I will turn it back over to the board. Um, Mr. Hodge, if you don't mind going back to, I believe it's slide nine for a moment. I don't have the slides by number, so you'll have to tell me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, just click back to the click. I think we're at the last slide, so if you'll click two in front of that. So two from the end. Yeah, we're at the end right now. I think if you'll go two back, that should be land us on nine. Um, I think that will do that's that slide six, but that's fine. I think it, I just wanted to point out to the board, uh, you know, the, the plot plan as, as drawn, um, um, shows the existing driveway. If, if for any reason, uh, you know, the driveways was going to be put on the other side, at, well past the fire hydrant there and the, and the, uh, proposed home was going to be moved to the left and down to the front of the lot. I think that that uh, I don't think that I think that would create a lot of problems, but I also wanted to point out that that would just be a create a big safety issue. As you can see the on the kind of the top left of the photo, there's a big bend in the road there um, and um, a really a, a major blind spot. So I just wanted to um, point that out to the board. And with that, um, I will rest my presentation. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hodge, anything further from you? No, sir. Okay, then we'll close the evidentiary hearing and move to the board for deliberations and a motion. I make a motion we approve. Thank you, Ms. Rudisill. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Mr. Mile, we have a second. Okay, a motion to approve and a second. Any further discussion from the board? Then Ms. Smith will move to our roll call vote. Chairman Swank. Approve. Mr. Kurtz. Approve. Mr. Sutton. Approve. Ms. Rudisell. Approve. Mr. Mile. Approve. You have five affirmative votes. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Moving on to our next case, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> this is 834 Mill Greens Court. Ann C. Bean is the property owner. This is a variance BOA 0023-2021. 
And uh, Ms. Bean, if you would please state your name and your address for the record, and I will affirm your oath. Ann C. Bean, 824 Mill Greens Court, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27609. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And is David Blevins here? Yes. Would you state your name and address for the record, please? David Blevins, engineer with Bass Mason Kennedy, 6310 Chapel Hill Road, Raleigh, 27607. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hodge, go ahead. Um, and being property owner requests a variance of five feet to the encroachment allowance set forth in section 1.5.4.D.1.A 5 5 of the Unified Development Ordinance in order to permit the construction of a porch on the rear of an existing townhouse um, that would be seven feet from the rear property line on a 0.11 acre property zoned uh, R6 located at 834 <clears throat> Mill Greens Court. Uh, so this uh, project, um, a common theme, I guess, uh, that you're seeing more and more at the Board of Adjustment is that we keep referencing pending text changes that would uh, make this issue go away. So we believe TC 520, which is addressing missing middle housing, uh, including townhomes, would um, essentially remove the need for this sort of a variance um, where they're going to be uh, removing the 20 foot rear yard requirement uh, for townhomes uh, on their individual townhome pad lots. Um, and further reducing it around the uh, a development edge when there is open space associated with that. So uh, this property backs up to a 30 foot, approximately 30 foot wide um, common area between the subject property and North Hills Drive. And then there would be an additional seven feet uh, at the rear of the lot under this proposal. Uh, so that would be in keeping with the, the uh, draft version that's going before council um, shortly on a TC 520. Um, but the applicant um, is proceeding ahead to try to uh, save some time on the calendar and get the project underway before TC 520 would be adopted and, and go into effect. Uh, as we're amending the code uh, to allow for this type of development, uh, staff has no opposition uh, to the proposed uh, layout. I'm trying to advance through the slides here. Bear with me. The seems to be frozen. There we go. This is just an aerial uh, showing the existing townhome and the open space at the rear. Uh, and this is the proposed um, plot plan showing uh, where they're uh, proposing to put the uh, porch at the rear of the home. And with that, I would conclude my presentation unless you have any other questions of me at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, board members, any questions for Mr. Hodge? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Ms. Bean, um, you may now present your evidence and legal arguments in support of your request. And let me remind you that any evidence and argument must focus on the applicable standards. So you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, as staff mentioned, the purpose of my variance request is to construct an enclosed porch on the same location and size as my existing deck. Um, in order to do so, I need to have a to encroach on the setback. And I have a letter from my HOA providing support, which has been entered for evidence. Um, and I have with me David Blevins, who can speak to that, and um, I can answer any questions, or he can. Okay, may I ask that uh, your ex your exhibits and application were provided ahead of time, but could you please ask that they be admitted into the record? Yes, please yeah. admit um, this evidence into record. Thank you very much. Okay, did you want to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Blevins for, for comment, or? Yes. Yes, please. 
Okay, go right ahead, Mr. Williams. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, I'll just be brief as well. Uh, I want to point out and make sure that uh, this this hardship was not created by the homeowner. It's the, the situation that's been discussed where um, all the existing deck she has, she just w would like to enclose it. Uh, it faces to the west, and it is a it, it's a it's a difficult uh, time to be able to use a deck in the summertime. So. Uh, as she mentioned, she also has uh, full support of the homeowners association. And uh, with that, if uh, either of us can answer any questions, we're happy to. Okay, thank you. Board, board members, do you have questions for the applicant or for Mr. Blevins? Okay, um, hearing none, no one else signed up in support or opposition to speak today. So we'll move to our closing. Um, I believe we've heard from the applicant. Uh, I trust there's nothing else you want to add at this time, Ms. Bean? Okay, hearing nothing. Uh, Mr. Hodge, uh, anything else from you? Uh, nothing else from staff, thank you. All right, let's close the evidentiary hearing, move to board deliberations. Um, in the interest of uh, Moving on, I'd like to move approval of this case, and I'll entertain a second. A second. A second. Yeah. Ms. Rudisol gave us a second. Uh, we have a motion and a second to approve any further discussion. We'll move to our roll call vote to uh, Ms. Smith. Chairman Swain. Approve. Mr. Kuntz. Approve. Mr. Sutton. Approve. Ms. Rudisall? Approve. Mr. Mile? Approve. You have five affirmative votes. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. And our next item of new business 5512, 5514, and 5524 Thornton Road, James and Michelle Ricks and Rosabelle and Wilson Thornton Jr property owners. This is a variance BOA 0026-2021. Cameron Jones, if you are with us, would you please state your name and address for the record and I will affirm your oath. Cameron, jo Cameron Jones, 6916 Buckhead Drive, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27615. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. And Emily Rothrock. I'm here. Yes, go ahead. Would you state your name and address for the record, please? Emily Rothrock, 817 Hillsborough Street, apartment E302, Raleigh, North Carolina. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. And Mr. Hodge, welcome again. Thank you. Uh, so this is a request for a variance to UDO section 8.3.3.A and UDO section 8.3.3.C in order to permit a recombination of three properties into three re reconfigured parcels, resulting in one newly configured parcel which does not have road frontage on a public street uh, and will also contain two existing principal detached single uh, unit dwelling structures on a single lot uh, and one newly configured parcel which will continue to maintain two existing principal single detached uh, dwelling structures on a single lot. Uh, the properties total 26.75 acres uh, and are split zoned residential 4 and residential 10 conditional use uh, and are located at 5512, 5514, and 5524. Thornton Road. Uh, the small yellow rectangle uh, in the center of the parcel is the one property today that is considered to be landlocked. Uh, the property that it sits within uh, currently has frontage on Thornton Road. Uh, the larger parcel at the southern edge of the property uh, has uh, two street stubs 
uh, news uh, farm, I believe, coming from the west, and uh, brambleberry um, coming from the east. So uh, they would be proposing a reconfiguration uh, that would create a new parcel uh, that, or create a parcel that has no structures on it today. And that would be a parcel that they're intending to um, sell for future development by um, one of the speakers uh, on the roster to speak to the matter today. And they would continue to have uh, a parcel that does not enjoy street frontage uh, until that parcel that is uh, being considered for sale would would be developed. And at that point, it would be provided um, street frontage. However, they are increasing the number of parcels um, that exist today that have more than one single family detached home on them. So today you have one parcel that has two homes, that being the, the large parcel at the south. Uh, under their proposed configuration, they would create two parcels, uh, which both have uh, two single family structures located on them. Um, the green parcel uh, is the one that would be increasing uh, this under this proposal to, ha to have two single family detached homes. Um, and it would continue to be landlocked until the blue uh, parcel shown here uh, would be developed. Uh, and this street infrastructure uh, is being uh, considered by the developer who's looking to acquire uh, this newly reconfigured parcel uh, from the sets of homeowners uh, that own these properties today. The yellow parcel to the south uh, currently has um, street frontage on two streets. It would, it would continue to have street frontage on one street under this proposed configuration, but what would be increasing in terms of a the degree of nonconformity um, is that there would there would continue to be uh, two homes. But again, it's it's really the green parcel that's increasing uh, in terms of nonconformity because they would have two homes on a on a parcel that today only has one. Um, we have talked to the applicants about our concerns. Uh, with this aspect, um, I would note that the entirety of these parcels are not inside the city's uh, municipal corporate boundaries today. Um, and so with a recombination, they're not subject to the exactions and same standards that would be in play if they were to be subdividing the parcels. So these parcels also, I believe, are served by well and septic and are not on the city's utility system. And this recombination would not trigger any compliance uh, with those standards. Uh, the subdivision of the blue parcel uh, would require that it be served by city utilities and submit an annexation uh, permit uh, application to the city. Um, but they're essentially kind of trying to remain outside the city limits for the parcel in green and yellow and continue to have those served by. Uh, well and septic and allow for each of those to to enjoy two single family homes per lot. Uh, there is a way in which they could be subdivided uh, under this proposed scheme um, and allow each lot to have street frontage on a separate street and not necessarily be um, on the same parcel. However, that future subdivision, as I noted, would trigger uh, compliance uh, with utility access uh, if available at that time. And I believe that's the, he the, he the hesitance on the part of the applicant um, to go forward with that in the future. So that's why they're seeking this variance uh, from the board today. Um, happy to answer any additional questions you may have at this time, uh, but otherwise that would conclude staff's presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hodge. Board members, do you have questions? Okay, then let us move along to uh, Michael Birch uh, representing the applicant. Mr. Birch, good morning. 
Good morning, Chairman Swink, uh, members of the board, Michael Birch with Longleaf Law Partners, 4509 Freedmore Road, Suite 302, Raleigh 27612. Uh, also on the meeting with me today is Cameron Jones with Terramore Homes and Emily Rothrock with ESP Associates. Um, as we begin our presentation, I would ask that our uh, application and our exhibits be entered into the record. Okay, thank you. And uh, we could go to the next slide. Um, first, I want to thank Mr. Hodge for uh, explaining what is uh, can be perceived to be a very kind of complicated request. And and what I want to do is to try to provide some background, uh, some context, and then kind of boil it down to really what the request is and and why we're requesting it. So, um, as background, um, the properties that you see highlighted in yellow are currently owned by the Thornton family and the Ricks family. And uh, the Ricks family owns the parcel on the south side, and the Thorntons own the two parcels on the north side. And these are uh, related, you know, part of the same family. And uh, the Thornton family has owned property in this area for generations. They are the namesake of the of the road, Thornton Road, that runs along the north. Um, so they have owned property in this area for a very long time. Family has been here for generations and they have um, kind of sold off parts of that family property over the years, you know, really for the subdivisions that you see around here. And so the property that they have today is really is where they live. Uh, and and really the kind of the purpose at the end of the day the purpose of this variance is to uh allow them to continue to live here in the way that they're living here while also allowing them to sell a portion of their property which i'll kind of get into the detail of so as mr hodge mentioned this these properties are within uh riley's planning jurisdiction but not within the city limits. Uh, and so these properties are not connected to city utilities. They're not paying um, city taxes. They are uh, served by well and septic. Um, from a, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll kind of identify for you the principal structures We able to go one more. Yeah, I'm just it just freezes up after I sit for. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, well, what will uh, hopefully come up is a just a zoomed in version of this, and um, there we go. And so hopefully you can maybe see my cursor, but uh, I'm identifying the two structures that are on the Thornton property today. One on the landlocked parcel, and the one just to the north. Those are existing homes uh, lived in by the Thorntons and uh, relatives. On the south side, there are uh, two structures, one here and here, uh, that are lived in by the Ricks and a related party. I want to note that the property today is served by a driveway off of Thornton Road. You can see it kind of coming down the left hand side of the parcel here, then comes in, serves the Rick's property, the Rick's homes, serves the Thornton uh, homes, and actually loops back out to Thornton Road. And this path also connects out to uh, Granberry Way. Uh, so again, that's existing today, and there's actually, you know, an easement that runs along uh, the west side of this house that, uh, or property that provides uh, kind of deeded access as well. So, uh, recently, uh, Terramore Homes uh, put under contract, let's see if we could go just to the last slide. Recently, Terramore Homes put under contract uh, a portion of the Thornton property and the Rigg property um, to develop as a townhome subdivision. That is the area that is in blue. Uh, so uh, that includes some land owned today by Thornton, some land owned today by Ricks. 
Uh, and so both Thornton and Ricks are selling property to, to Terramore for this future subdivision. Uh, but they are also retaining land where their homes are so that they can continue living there. The area being retained by Thornton is in green uh, and is just over four acres, uh, 4.13 acres. And then the property being retained by Ricks there in yellow is about 7.81 acres. Uh, Terry Moore and families recently went through the rezoning process to rezone uh, that portion of the property in blue uh, to R10 conditional use to allow for the townhome development uh, that you see there. And Terry Moore has submitted a subdivision plan for that R10 zone property. And that, that rezoning was approved in, in the fall of 2020. Uh, as part of the process of purchasing the, we'll call it the development tract, the blue piece um, that includes a portion of Thornton and a portion of Ricks. Uh, the families need to create this kind of blue parcel in order to sell it and have it be further subdivided by Terramore. Uh, and they would like to do that in a way that would not require them to subject the portions of the property where they want to remain living. Uh, they don't want to have to include those portions of the property within this subdivision, which would require them to be annexed into the city, connection to utilities. They would also have to comply with stormwater. They have to be factored in into stormwater and tree conservation and all these other things. Um, really, when they're not ready to develop these pieces that they are retaining and wish to, to live on. And so that's kind of the purpose of this process is to create this development track that they can sell uh, and then kind of delay having to annex, connect to utilities and be subject to all these UD, UDO requirements so that they can continue living on this property. And then when they do sell these properties in the future for redevelopment, then they'll be subject to all of the city requirements at that time. So Mr. Hodge mentioned uh, there are three lots existing today and we wanna reconfigure those into three lots, uh, which will allow for a recombination, which will allow for the, the green and the yellow portions of the property to not be subject to the UDO at this time. Um, but of course, we'll be subject to it in the future. A recombination is allowed where the total number of lots are not increased, and then where the resultant lots equal or exceed the minimum lot standards. So we've, we're able to check that first box. We're not increasing the total number of lots. We have three today, we'll have three you know, in the recombination. The, the second standard, uh, that's where we have trouble. The resultant lots equal or exceed minimum standards. And the two issues where we have an issue, you know, a problem here is 8.3.3a, lot frontage, and 8.3.3c, uh, the principal structures per lot. So uh, as to lot frontage, um, you can see that the portion retained by Ricks in the yellow uh, still has frontage on Noose Farm Road uh, down here in the southwest corner of the property. Of course, the, the blue track, the development track, will have road frontage here on Thornton Road. Um, the issue is to this green portion uh, retained by Thornton. With approval of the variance, we are asking that this parcel for a period of time not have street frontage on a public street. As I mentioned, this area in orange here, they still have the existing private easement. So they have access uh, to Thornton Road. They actually, again, have access out to Brambury over the Ricks property, uh, but they've got deeded kind of platted easement access uh, today, and that, that remains. Additionally, as part of the first phase of subdivision, of that development track, the blue parcel, um, there will be right of way, a, a street stubbed to the Thornton track. That is that area in 
red. Of course, they're also have right of way frontage on the on the future road here in the northeast as well. Uh, there's another connection point here. Um, so, and we're willing to offer that as a condition that as part of the first phase of development of that development tract, um, that the public street be you know, essentially stubbed to the Thornton parcel, the area retained by Thornton. Um, so again, we're just kind of asking for this temporary moment of time where Thornton will not have frontage on the public street, uh, which again is somewhat of a condition that exists today for that small little rectangular piece. Uh, but we will be providing public street frontage and actually kind of better, safer access as a part of the first phase of development. Um, as Mr. Hodge mentioned, part of the variance, again, there are two homes existing on the Rick's property today. We're asking for that to be allowed to remain uh, for this period of time until the yellow property redevelops. Um, there would be two structures on the piece retained by Thornton that we are asking to allow to be remain uh, to remain. Um, again, those are occupied by the Thorntons and related family. Um, so big picture, we are trying to create that blue development parcel while maintaining the status quo for the properties to be retained by Thornton and Ricks. Mr. Hodge mentioned, and I just want to kind of further emphasize that the development parcel, once created, it's already in the subdivision process, is fully subject to the city UDO, all of the requirements, annexation, utilities, everything. That will be you know, fully compliant with the UDO. We're asking that the two properties retained by Thornton and Ricks not have to go through that process today. We're not asking to exempt them for all time. We're just asking to allow for this recombination um, so that they can continue to live there as they are today, maintain the status quo. And then when those properties come in for redevelopment, they will be subject to all of the city's regulations, annexation, everything. So just touch on the on the standards. So without a variance, um, essentially a, a recombination would not be allowed uh, because we cannot meet that standard uh, for recombination. As a result, uh, those resultant tracks that would be retained by Thornton and Ricks would be subject to all of the UDO requirements today, even though those portions of the property are not redeveloping. That includes stormwater, tree conservation, they would essentially have to be part of the uh, stormwater covenant, the association. Um, all of these things should be applied to these properties in the future when they redevelopment, re when they redevelop. We're just asking for a delay until the time that it makes sense when these properties come in for their own development plan. Uh, another hardship is they would have to be annexed, pay city taxes, hook up to utilities when they are already, again, well served by well and septic uh, as they have been for decades. Um, again, the development track will, will do just that today. So uh, also without a variance, it would require the demolition of one of the houses, again, used by Thornton family that is, again, well served by well and septic today. Um, these hardships, again, are peculiar to the property. There's already a, an existing lot with no lot frontage. Uh, the location of these existing structures really kind of dictate the portion of the property that they can uh, sell and, and still live there. Um, and again, that those structures have been there for generations, decades. Um, we think that this is consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the ordinance. Um, the purpose of the that 8.3.3 generally, uh, one aspect of that is to provide for the safe uh, legal means of access to, to lots. Again, this is ensured by the existing easement uh, for the Thornton property and also by the condition that will require 
uh, public street stub to the Thornton pro uh, property as part of phase one of the development of the blue parcel. Uh, the UDO is being applied to the portion that's developing. Uh, we think that you know, sub substantial justice is served by essentially asking for and allowing for a delay uh, of the application of the UDO to those portions of the property retained by the families. Uh, we also think that substantial, substantial justice would be done by allowing the existing structures to remain uh, and allowing these long-term landowners to sell a portion of their property while still living there. I do wanna note that the lots that are being retained by Thornton and Ricks do meet the minimum lot dimensions, lot width, lot depth, the amount of acreage needed for the density that are on there. You know, there's two houses. And actually this um, proposal will provide uh, ultimately better access um, to Thornton and Ricks with development of that uh, development parcel. So uh, with that, again, I know um, it's a little complicated, but I hope that we've been able to adequately explain what we're trying to achieve, and that is to uh, maintain the status quo for the Thornton and the Ricks uh, while allowing them to sell a portion of their property to be developed under the UDO. Uh, and then again, the UDO can be applied to them in the future when they come in for redevelopment. Uh, and I know I've got uh, Cameron Jones and Emily Rothrock on if there are any, uh, any questions, uh, but we appreciate your time and, and would ask that you approve the variance. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Birch. I have a couple of questions, but let me offer it to the board first. And board members, do you have questions? Mr. Birch, you referred to a period of time. So what determines um, in your mind a period of time? Right, so uh, right now, Terramore Homes is uh, in review for subdivision. Um, they're essentially waiting on this matter to be resolved, uh, at which time they'll be able to get uh, preliminary subdivision approval and move straight to construction drawings. They're, you know, they have contractual obligations uh, to these landowners, you know, to close at a certain time. And they're trying to get as far down the process as they can uh, before they're obligated to close. Um, and so as soon as they can get this subdivision approval, that allows them to get their site permits to begin site work, uh, which will then allow them to record uh, the right of way uh, to the Thorntons. Again, in the meantime, Thorntons will have access just like they do today. Uh, from a timing standpoint, just from the approval processes, you know, it could be, and, and with site work, um, you know, it could be, 12, 18 months. Um, again, they're, that's just for a point in time where they won't have frontage on a right of way, uh, but their access will continue to be just as it is today. And they'll have legal access as well, you know, through that private easement that's existed for a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chairman. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, other questions? Well, that, that was one that I was curious about, so thank you for asking that. The, Mr. Birch, you referred to a willingness to offer a condition about the public street being stubbed. If, if this development goes through as proposed in the 12 to 18 months you mentioned, would there actually be a need to have that condition? Wouldn't that street come to exist anyway? Um. Well, so it would come to exist at some point in time, but, you know, theoretically, this is not just given access, et cetera. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was included in the first phase so that it would be uh, as soon as possible. So, and to require, so essentially that would require the first phase to take place up closer to Thornton Road, as opposed to the first phase being closer to uh, Banbury, Branbury way down here, uh, down in the southeast portion, because if they started and did the first phase in the southeast portion, you know, they wouldn't be constructing a public road closer to the Thornton property to giving them public street access. So 
that that's why we wanted to add that condition to make sure and to give the board confidence that you know the, the first plat first subdivision plat for the uh development parcel would include the right of way to the thornton property so you're you're asking that that condition be added yeah yes sir okay all right thank if, you. If we'll... staff may add that would be something we would be looking for typically anyway but having it in a condition makes it even more certain. Great, thank you, Mr. Hodge. It's always good to be reaffirmed in that. Okay, um, and we'll be clear on that language as we put a motion together. Okay, and you clarified the question about the trigger for me is when when this would occur. So the, so the, the part of that is the properties retained by the Thorns and, and the hit Ricks. Um, which they may actually hold on to for years, conceivably, the development going on around them. So they would not be subject to UDO until they actually sold or redeveloped their own property. Right. It's, it's, so let me be clear. When I say that they're not subject to the UDO, you know, at this time, I mean they are, they are still within the, the city's planning jurisdiction. So let's say that you know. This recombination was allowed to occur, the variance. And so, you know, Ricks retains the yellow portion of the property. Um, they're still, again, still subject to the UDO. We're just saying that they're not subject to the UDO at this point in time from a subdivision standpoint. So we're not having to comply with block perimeter, stub street, tree conservation, stormwater on the Ricks parcel today. Of course, if they came in for certain permits, they would be subject to the UDO. They'd be dealing with the city. Okay, good. That thank you. That that helps to clarify that. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're not trying to like kind of waive them of everything for all time. Just really to get through it and allow this reconfiguration of the lots. Okay, good. Okay, board. Other questions? Okay, no one else signed up to speak either in opposition or in support of this. So we'll move to our closing. Um, Mr. Birch, anything further from you? Uh, no, sir, unless you want me to take a stab at um, the condition language. Uh, Ms. Hill, would that be helpful? It would be. I've typed up or something that I think um, captures what was discussed, but um, also we can hear from the applicant as well. And one thing that I would just point out with the condition, is that um, if I don't know how it would be enforced <laughs> if the recombination is approved um, in, in the event the road is not constructed, um, it would be really difficult, I think, to probably enforce that. But that's a matter for, for staff to weigh in on whether that would be a problem for them. But with that said, I do have some language that I could um, I put together for the condition if you would like me to do that. I would welcome your view on this. Absolutely. Um, let's get to that in a moment. Um, Mr. Hodge, anything further from you? Um, as it relates to the condition, any, any future subdivision of the blue parcel, as I understand it, would trigger compliance with the, the matter at hand in terms of getting that Thornton property street frontage. Th that's something the UDO would direct staff to do. Um, the only development that I'm that might could occur of the blue parcel that might be exempt from that would be if someone decided to build a single family home on the blue parcel that that would not trigger um, compliance with uh, providing the Thornton property with dedicated street frontage. So the condition may well speak to, you know, not allowing a single family home permit on the blue parcel and essentially any or, or, or a duplex attached house because those would be exempt from the requirement to provide the frontage unless those types of applications were also conditioned to provide that. So I think the condition at hand is basically saying any permit associated, you know, subdivision or building permit associated with the blue parcel uh, would be required to provide um, the Thorn property with street access. 
that's that's really the matter at hand, I, I believe. So as long as we, you know, get a, a, a VAT buttoned up, I, I don't really think there's much concern moving forward. Otherwise, the blue parcel would sit there fallow, you know, which is the case today. Essentially, this there's already one Thornton property that's landlocked. This is just making it larger. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, I think we probably need to clarify this before we close the uh, discussion, just to be sure we're all on the same page. So, Mr. Birch, did you want to offer a uh, specific language that we could then uh, contemplate? Sure, and, and I will say we we would consent to I think what Mr. Hodge raised about the the building permit, um, so that you know as part of uh, any subdivision plat or building permit uh, application, you know that public street frontage would be provided to the uh, property retained by Thornton. I'm sure Ms. Hill could say it more eloquently, but that we can send to that. Yes. I think that would cover what I was saying, and I, I do have some proposed language if you want to hear that. Yes, if you okay. have it. Um, and here's what I'd recommend doing is that the, the slide you have up on the screen is in the applicant's application as well, and there it is referenced as um, Overall site plan sheet one of four sheet C 2.0. I recommend just saying that for purposes of this condition, that is considered exhibit one. Um, and, and Ms. Smith, I'll get all this to you in, in writing too. Um, so, with that said, in the condition, this would be um, exhibit one. The first phase of any development for the development parcel, which is the parcel shown in blue on exhibit one will include the construction of a public street that provides access from the Thornton property, and I'm sorry, from Thornton Road to the property to be retained by Thornton, which is the parcel shown in green on Exhibit 1. Um, the other part that I had here, which Mr. Birch, I'm not too clear on, is if you wanted to add the location of the public street is shown in red on Exhibit 1. I don't know if you want to be, um, if that's the exact location you guys were intending. Yeah. I think if we could leave it open ended, just because this, who knows if this plan may change. And again, they they are getting both street frontage from that red, but as well as the the street that kind of branches off of that as well. So if the board is is willing to kind of leave it open ended and just say that they'll have public street frontage from Thornton Road. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, both of you, uh, for helping to clarify that, and we will get that language to Ms. Smith for the proper notation. Okay, um, if there's no further discussion from anyone, we will close the uh, evidentiary hearing and now move to our board deliberations where we will consider a motion uh, with a condition. Mr. Sweet, before you do that, so to Ms. Ms. Hill's point about the enforcement. So is, is that going to be addressed in this motion as well? Or she made a comment she was not sure how that could be uh, captured. The way the, the condition reads is that the condition is enforced, becomes enforceable when the development okay. of the blue parcel, when any type of development is undertaken on the blue parcel, which is labeled as the development parcel. So when, when that parcel is developed as the either as the first phase of development, if it's going to have multiple phases or develop or anything at all, they would have to construct the road. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yes, sir. Okay, still entertain a motion here. And this is Mr. Miles. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve with all the said conditions. Thank you, Mr. Mile. We have a motion to approve with a condition that has been uh, discussed earlier. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, Ms. Smith, we can move to a roll call vote on this, please. Yes, uh, Chairman Swank. Approve. 
Mr. Cooks? Approved. Mr. Sutton? Approved. Ms. Rudisil? Approved. Mr. Mile? Approved. You have five affirmative votes. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, we can move on to our additional business, the approval of the minutes of our May 10th, 2021 board meeting. I have two uh, minor corrections. On the first page, uh, Mr. Butler's uh, middle initial should be a capital T instead of a lowercase t. And at the bottom of the second page, the word uh, where, W-H-E-R-E, -E should be were, W-E-R-E. -E. I didn't see anything else. Does not mean I didn't overlook other things. But anybody else have any additions or corrections to the minutes? Have a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Mr. Mile, thank you. I have a second. John Coon, second. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Smith, we may uh, we do a roll call vote for the minutes as well. Could I get clarification as to who seconded that motion? I didn't hear it. John Coons. And thank you, Mr. Coons. Chairman Swink. Approve. Mr. Coons. Approve. Mr. Sutton. Approve. Ms. Rudisil. Approve. Mr. Mile. Approve. You have five affirmative votes for approval. Super. Thank you very much. Ms. Hill, anything from you today? Nope, that covers it. Uh, Mr. Uh, Swink, uh, this yes, is Ms. Mile. I have one question before we uh, move forward. Sure. Uh, in our uh, last, not our last case, the case uh, with uh, Green Court, uh, question on the address. Uh, one location has 834 Mill Greens Court, then the other document has got 824 Mills Green Court. So I just want to make sure to clarify exactly what the address is uh, for record. Excellent. Good catch. Thank you. I think is Mr. Hodge still on the line? Because I think that was his case. Yeah, I believe it's uh, 824. Let me verify. Hold on just a moment. 824 Mill Greens Court. Right. Good. Anyone else? Thank you. Well, I'm sorry to hear about Ralph. I did not know that. We uh, we certainly wish him a quick recovery. But Miss Smith, you are welcome to join us anytime. We are delighted to have you and thank you for your assistance today. And if there's no other business before us, then we uh, stand adjourned. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Everybody Thank you. Stay well. Everyone have a good day. Right. Everybody have a blessed day. Bye. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.